Why do you love your cell phone? Well, we make calls. Where we make calls on our phones. It's so much easier to find. I, you can find someone now, whatever, whenever, by simply making a phone call. How many of you are into selfies? Yeah, selfies. Pastor Emmanuel. Pastor Selfie. Millions of selfies are taken every single day. People love themselves. Some people have complained that, you know, for people who take a lot of selfies, they have some sort of disorder, some narcissistic type thingy going on around them. I just want to ask you, if you've ever, have you ever been in a group picture? Have you ever been in a group picture? Yes. When you get to see the photo, whose face do you look for first? Yes. There you have it. It's just a bigger selfie. That's what it is. It's, I heard it was called a wealthie. <laughs> it's a computer keyboard. It allows me to type text messages. I can pay bills. It's a clock. It's a calendar. It's a scheduler. I can send emails. I can, I can do all sorts of things. It keeps records a lot of records. There's the power of something called the screenshot. And this, yeah, there's people who will go to jail because of screenshots. It, it's an evidence changer in court. It's a calculator. It will even tell you how many steps you've walked or you need to walk to be in your optimum health. But who cares? It's a phone. It's not a human being. He doesn't know how it feels like to walk. <laughs> From town to Westlands. In this sun. <laughs> and so regardless if you have a simple or a sophisticated phone, now Apple guys, calm down. There's a common problem that everybody that has a cell phone experiences. This is the big thing about cell phones. Oh, by the way, what's, what's better between a Samsung and an iPhone? Infinix. <laughs> well, the jury is still out there. It makes no difference what phone you have. All phones have a problem. It's that moment of the day, you're busy, you're doing so much, there's so many things you're doing, you're running up and down, you're sending messages and stuff, and you pick it up and, you, and you're, you're about to um, do something on your phone, and the, the top right corner of your phone begins to flash, and a beeping, annoying beeping sound goes like beep beep, informing you that your battery is on its way out. And for most people... That's the same as receiving the news from the doctor that your life is about to run out. It's like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? And for some of us, that's it. It's the end of what we really wanted to do. But thankfully, we have power banks. As somebody shouted before I got to my point. By the way, I don't know who read my notes over here. I was shouting. Um, <laughs> when your battery dies, then you, know, you have to figure out something. You have to figure out how do I bring it back to life. So you have a power bank that allows you to recharge your battery and bring your cell phone back to life. And in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, your prayer life is like a phone battery. There are times when your prayer life is fully charged. It's full. You're spiritually enthusiastic. You're full of the God life. You're full of faith. You want to pray. You want to proclaim the things that God has promised you. You feel good. You're in a good place spiritually. Your battery is full. You're like at 98%, doing very, very well. And then there are times that stuff happens, life happens, and then all of a sudden you're depleted and you have no spiritual or prayer battery at all. It's like I have no energy, I have no power, I have no hunger, I have no passion, I have no desire to pray. In fact, I don't even feel like a Christian. It's just my spiritual battery is dead, is out. And so this is a big, big problem. Because now we're wondering, okay, so 
I don't want to pray. I don't feel like praying. I don't even know if God is going to answer my prayers. It's a big, it's a challenging situation. And every single person that has been a Christian for longer than two seconds will tell you that this is true. You will encounter these periods when you're drained and your battery is running out and you are out of your spiritual energy. And in its time like this, when we need to move from just going through the motions of our spiritual life and recharge and re-energize our spiritual battery. But the question most people ask is how? How do you charge your spiritual batteries? How do you get yourself to a place where you re-energize or revitalize that spiritual life, that energy that you have that helps you begin to commune with God, to be in a good place spiritually where you can actually enjoy your, your walk of faith and your prayer life? Because I can assure, I've been a Christian for a long time and um, I've experienced this as well. So what do you do to recharge your spiritual batteries? I'm glad you asked. Because we're going to look in the book of Mark chapter 6. We're going to look at what Jesus did. Because Jesus has an answer. Jesus has a solution for us. In Mark chapter 6, if you have your Bible, uh, you can turn there. If you have your well-charged cell phone, you can turn there as well. We're going to read it. If you have no Bible and you have no phone, then you can follow us on the screen. I think they're going to project that on the screen. These are the words of Jesus in verse 31 and verse 32. Let's read it together. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they left by boat for a quiet place so they could be alone. They could be alone. For you to get a proper understanding of what it was going on here, you have to back up into verses 7 to 13 of the same chapter. And when you look, you see what's going on. Jesus, it says, he called his 12 disciples together and began sending them out two by two, giving them authority to cast out devils. And he told them to take nothing for their journey except a walking stick. No food, no traveler's bag, no money. He allowed them to wear sandals, but not to take a change of clothes. Do you ever stop, like when you're reading your Bible, and sort of like think about some of the things that you read? Like, Like you just, you're like, so Jesus sends these guys out on a mission, and he tells them not to carry a change of clothes. And he gives them authority and power to cast out devils, devils and demons. But they have no change of clothes. The last time I checked preachers around casting out devils, it's a pretty sweaty affair. <laughs> Jesus, really? I mean, yeah, we're going to do the work, but now we, we, can't, we have nothing to change into. Does that bother you? I, I'm just, I, just thought, I just thought you read your Bible and stop sometimes and wonder. Wherever you go, he said, stay in the house, in the same house, until you leave town. And then you're going to stay in someone else's house. <laughs> until you leave. With no change of clothes? Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> Jesus sent his disciples without a change of clothes. Have you actually thought about that? <laughs> Is it just me? Like, you know, like... Yeah, in someone's house. And you stay in that one house. You go cast out devils. And, and, and you know, back those days, it, it wasn't as, you know, like it is these days, you know. You know, it was dusty and hot and animals and humans were interacting, so. And then you're going to pray for people and lay hands. People will be slain one way or another. So anyway, so, 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 so those are my problems sometimes when I read the good book. Um, <laughs> so it says, but if you, <laughs> if Jesus sent his disciples without a change of clothes. It says, Has anybody seen this? Um, but if any place refuses to welcome you or listen to you, shake its dust from your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned those people to their fate. So the disciples went out 
telling everyone they met to repent of their sins and turn to God. And they cast out many demons and healed many sick people, anointing them with olive oil. So here they are, they've been sent on a mission by Jesus himself. It must be an extremely exciting time for them. Remember, they were fishermen, they were messed up people, God has called them, they've He's he's now given them power and authority. And now they're actually seeing the same things that Jesus has been doing. They're they're happening. People are getting healed. Stuff is happening. Miracles are happening. Uh, They don't have a change of clothes, but that's that's okay. They're just doing stuff. And so, yeah, awesome. Then they come back. and, And you can imagine the excitement after starting to see the results of what they had set themselves out to do. And sharing them with Jesus. You know that excitement you feel when you actually set on something, embark on something, and exactly what you planned and started happens, and you come back and you're so full of excitement. This is exactly what's happened. These are his disciples. They're, they're thrilled. They're full of happiness and joy. They're like, yes, and they're sharing it with him. They're telling him what has happened. Now, some time had passed between the time that Jesus had sent them to preach and teach and when they returned. So there was some time that had, had gone by here. By this time, John had been killed in prison by Herod. We read in verse 30 and 31, the apostles returned to Jesus from the ministry tour. So it was a ministry tour and told him all that they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, so here's where you expect Jesus to congratulate them, whatever, you know, it's, it's a great celebration. But then Jesus says, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. And he said this, here's the interesting thing. He says this because there are so many people who are coming. Obviously, you can imagine people being healed, people are being touched, people are being transformed. It's amazing. And so they've heard the fame. They're like, if these are the disciples doing these things, the master must be on another level. So we're going to see him. So they're flocking to see Jesus. They're coming and going, and stuff is happening. And Jesus, smack in the middle of the best thing that would ever happen to him or his disciples, he says, hey, stop. Let's go off. Let's go off to a quiet place and be by ourselves. Now, the reason was there were so many people going that Jesus, going and coming, Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. And while they were telling him about this kingdom, Jesus looks at them and he's concerned about the right things. Let me stop here and say that Jesus is always concerned about the right things in your life. Not just the good things, but the right things in your life. Amen. He says... Let's go off to the side. He was concerned about their spiritual and their physical well-being. They were exhausted. They were tired. And they were not eating. They they were constantly doing ministry. He saw this and it bothered him. And so because they were not getting recharged and he understood something. And this is important for us to understand. We're going to get to that into a moment. That the enemy of your prayer life is not just the good things happening in your life. It's the busyness of life. The enemy to your prayer life and to your spiritual power is not just the devil, but it's the busyness of life. In fact, success can become a big enemy to your prayer life. You can become so successful without God's... Do you know you can be successful without God's help? Hello? Anybody in here? You can be successful without God's help. In fact, God's blessing is not an indication of God's favor, necessarily. We know that because... We know that because some of you have been living like the devil, but God still blesses you. You've not prayed, not been to church for a while, not giving... But some of you are sworn non givers. <laughs> but God still blesses you. Some of you are living in blatant, open disobedience to God. But He still blesses you. And you know why He blesses you? Because His blessings and His goodness is dependent on His character, not on your goodness, not on my goodness. God is God whether we are good or not. And he's faithful and he's, that's why he blesses you so much until you're like, eh, you know, I need to show up in church, by the way, I need to serve, I need to do something. (laughs) It's like, because I can begin to count, I don't deserve that, I don't deserve that, I don't deserve that. It's his goodness 
has nothing to do with your prayer life. Now, let me tell you why it's important for you to pray. We do not pray so that we can get things from God. The reason we pray is so that we can have a spiritual life that's healthy. That we can have a relationship with God. It has nothing to do with stuff and things and what we want. Yeah, they play a part at some point. But that's not the real reason we pray. Jesus looks at his disciples and says, look, it's not about the miracles and the power and the stuff that's happening. It's not about the success in your business, in your career, in your relationships and all that. No, that's not, what it's, that's not the reason you pray. The reason you pray is because you need spiritual power. You need to be spiritually energized. Because if you're not, you're going to be spiritually dead. And the problem with spiritual deadness is because we cannot see it until it's too late. You know, you don't walk around and see people like with like a battery logo, spiritual battery logo here on their forehead. And, nee, nee, nee. Haven't been in church for a while. Nee, 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 nee. Has not been praying for a while. Nee, nee. Has not fasted for a while. So this man, this woman is spiritually weak. We don't see that. There's just no way of seeing it. So we can't tell. And we know God is good, so you might be you actually might be prospering and doing well and having, living a pretty good life, but you're spiritually dead. And Jesus looks at his disciples. Everything looks good. He says, hey, we're going to fix this thing. And there's two things that he does. I want to talk about the first thing he says is let's get away. Let's leave. Let's leave. The first, the first thing that we see, we can learn from that story. There's two things we can learn from this story. The first one is that Jesus cares when your spiritual battery is dead. Jesus cares when my spiritual battery is dead. He cares. It bothers him. It bothers him when we cannot pray. It bothers him when we are feeling out of energy, out of breath spiritually, when we're about to crash when we're neglecting to spend time in prayer, when we're unable to meditate on him and on his goodness and the greatness of our God, when we neglect to feed ourselves spiritually from his word every day because he knows it's a matter of time before the life, world, and the things around us come crashing down on us. He's bothered by that. He cares deeply that we be in a place where we're spiritually well. So what did he do? Is the second thing he counseled them to do, the second thing that we learn from this, from this story, and that is to get away from distractions. Get away from distractions. You are too distracted to pray, and those distractions will take you out spiritually. That's what he's saying. In other words, he says these things that are happening in your life that are less important than prayer. And his prayer is the most important thing because it is what sustains you. It's what keeps you going spiritually. And so he says, get away from these things that are distracting you. His cure for a dead prayer battery was to withdraw and get away from distraction. In verse 31, he says, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. Someone once said that if you don't come apart and rest, you will eventually come apart. In other words, you have to be intentional about carving time and creating time to recharge yourself spiritually, your spiritual batteries. You must establish a prayer as a priority in your life. And listen, we are some of the busiest people on the planet. Jesus in Luke 5, 16 says, it says of Jesus, but Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. When Luke says he often withdrew, it means he went away from people. Listen, people were Jesus' main agenda. This was his purpose. His purpose was people. I don't know what your purpose is, but whatever it is, Jesus' main purpose was people, but he withdrew from his purpose to go and pray and to be alone and to recharge. The same thing with you. Whatever your purpose is, you're going to need to withdraw from it so then you can pray, so that you can re-energize yourself. He recharged his spiritual batteries by going off alone to a quiet place of solitude for a while to pray and to re-energize what do you do when your cell phone goes dead? You plug it into the charger, the power source, and you leave it alone for a while. Although not, some, not all of us do that. Some of us have to milk the productivity out of it. Work a charger and let continue working. But normally, typically, you leave it alone for a while. You let it fill up. You let it charge up. And this is the same thing. We unplug from the world, from the business of life, and then we plug into God. Each day in prayer. I know this because it's really hard. It's very hard to stay spiritually charged when you're being drained by television, movies, conversations, social media, work. We are so interconnected. Everything, everything is calling for your attention. 
In fact, scientists are saying that since the mid-1990s, when, when the internet um, really blew up and, and spread in its usage, our ability to concentrate and our attention span has been greatly diminished. In other words, we're like two-year-olds. Our attention span is just so, so short because it's just there's so many signals coming at us that we, have to, we, we cannot concentrate for long. And we're struggling to concentrate when we try to read the Bible or to pray. And the solution is to unplug from that, to unplug from technology, to unplug from things for a while. And this is so difficult. And we're going to talk about that. That's, and maybe for some of us, your solitude is that moment in your car. That's your sacred space. Use it well. Use it well. Shut it off and it's quiet. Sometimes Maybe it's a time in your office. Sometimes it's, you can take a walk and go somewhere and just look at nature. Just unplug. Find somewhere. And let me say, you're going to have to fight for it because there's, everything is crying for your attention. Everything is crying for our attention except prayer. So we can re-energize ourselves spiritually. So it's very important for us to pray. It's very important for us to re-energize ourselves spiritually. Now, now that we understand that Jesus wants, is concerned about us when, we are, when our battery is dead, and he wants us to go away, to sort of separate ourselves a little bit, to have some silence and solitude so we can be able to pray, then how do you form a, a helpful pattern for prayer? Because patterns is what's going to help you. Habits are what's going to help us. Forming a habit of when to pray, when to plug in, when to connect with God. It could be in the morning, it could be in the evening, it could be during the day. But what's, forming those habits is going to be helpful. So how do we pray in, and how do we form around this habit? Very good. I'm glad you asked. I'm not sure some of you might know this. Uh, it's an acronym, A-C-T-S. And that is Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and supplication. There's four things that you involve in your prayer life. In that moment, in that time that you're away with God, that's going to recharge your batteries. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Say that with me. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Say it with me again. Adoration. Say it one more time. The four things that you incorporate into your prayer life to begin to recharge your spiritual batteries. Adoration. When you come to God and you come into his presence and now you have time, you've shut the world away, you're connecting with God, we begin your time of prayer with adoration or worship. To adore is to subscribe or to ascribe worth, value, honor to God. You begin by lifting him up, by proclaiming his goodness, by magnifying who he is. Because that's what sets the entire tone. Because it reminds you of who he is. It reminds us of who God is. And let me tell you, life has a way of whipping us around until we forget who God is, how great he is, how powerful he is, that he is the creator of the universe, that he is the great, great big God. But life can so happen until you begin to wonder, and this God, by the way, if he so created the universe, where is he? Like if my life can be here, how can I be going through this stuff? Where is this God? Because life happens or you experience things and you begin to question the greatness of God. The reason you adore him is because your mind has to be reminded of who he is, how great he is, how powerful he is, how able he is, how strong he is, how faithful he is, how present he is. Would you like me to continue? How awesome and amazing our God is. We must be reminded because we forget as we experience the world and the pressures that it brings. You tell your mind, you read in the Psalms, and David constantly just magnified the Lord, just lifted him up. You are awesome, you're powerful, you're the great king over all the earth. Your name is great and greatly to be praised. We will run to you, we will praise you, we will bless your name. I mean, he just constantly said these things. And he was a man of war, so you have to imagine he's facing death constantly. He's facing challenges constantly. But he reminded himself of how great God was. And so we must adore him. Somebody say, adoration. adoration. We must remind ourselves by adoring God. We express our adoration. 
So you focus on an attribute that relates to where you are at, to what your needs are at the moment. Maybe you need, we remind ourselves how great he is, how powerful he is. My soul shall remember how great God is because I adore him. So adore him. Write it down. Write it down. Sing songs. Sing psalms that remind you of how great he is. Sometimes you will say them. Sometimes you will write them. Sometimes you will sing them out. And listen, especially when life has been rough, it may be very difficult in the beginning to even adore God. It may just be such a challenge because, gosh, life has been hard, man. Let's just throw in the prayer items and move on. But when we adore him, Father, we adore you today. We bless you. You're powerful. You're awesome. It brings such a great change. It brings such a great transformation. In your mind, it reminds you and me of who he is. All right? The second thing that you do is what? After you adore him, what do you do next? Huh? Confession. Now, let me say this. Let me begin by saying this. That in a way, I think confession is one of the most neglected areas of our prayer lives today. I think so. And the reason I think is that I don't think that it's not that we do not confess our sins. I think it's just the way we go about it when we come into God's presence. Now, let me tell you something about confession. Confession is us when we begin to bring our sins to God. When we begin to talk about our shortcomings, our faults, the things that we've missed or messed, messed up in. Now, how many of you are parents here? Let me see by a show of hand, parents. Now, as a parent, most likely you have, we have two types of children. There's two types of Christians as well. There's two types of children. The first type is children who, when they do something wrong and they mess up, and you, you know, and you call them out on it, and you're dealing with the issue, they want to move on quickly out of it. They're like, you know, so, you know, so I didn't do my chores. So like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then they're like, okay, okay, Dad, you said we were going to go to the mall. When are we going to the mall? Wait a minute. Do you understand what we're dealing with this issue first? I need you to understand that you cannot do, you cannot behave the way you behave. That's wrong. But they're like, no, no, no. They want to move fast because they, they do not like the feeling of acknowledging that they are guilty and, and they don't want that. So they want to move quickly. And, and so you have, and you have that and then you have a second type of child who is when, when, you, when they've done something wrong and you call them out on it, they're like, that's it. My, my life is over. All is lost. I'm such a bad child. I will never amount to anything. Now what shall I do? Now I can't even eat. I don't even deserve to be a member of this. One. You're like, what? I didn't say those things. That's not the point. Okay? And, and, and for this, for the first child, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get them to see the grievous harm that their disobedience or whatever it is has caused because their behavior has consequences. You want them to understand that. And so you are trying to slow them down because they want to move on. For the second child, what you want to do is you want to help them to move on from there. Okay, hey, listen, we've dealt with it. You've said you're sorry. You don't have to say sorry a hundred times. That's good. That's enough. You can now move on. You can be happy again. You're still a member of the tribe. <laughs> and the Christians, as Christians, were just like that. As some of us, when, we, when it comes to confession, as we come to God, and we're like, you know, oh God, forgive me for all my sins. Now, Father, I pray for that car. I pray for that promotion. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for favor. And God said, wait, 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 wait a, wait a moment. Part of confession is looking inward. When you go to pray, you need to look inward. Because it's not so, you know, you're not as good as you think you are. We're not as good as we think we are. Sometimes when we confess, we're like, you know, you know, I lied today. You know, what I did hurt someone. Um, uh, you know, or I didn't keep my word. Um, I wasn't a good example. There's all these things that have happened that I've done. And so we, we sort of are reminded of that. And then we say, Lord, I am sorry for what I've done. I recognize, I'm aware of my sin, my fault. And Lord, would you forgive me? Would you cleanse me? Would you release me? Would you allow me to experience forgiveness? And then you receive forgiveness, and that's wiped away, and it's forgotten, and you can move on. And then the second type of Christians are people who have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And we feel we're overwhelmed by guilt and shame and embarrassment for the things we've done. And we're never moving away from it. And there's some of you here who've confessed for the same sin a hundred times. 
Every time you come into a time of prayer, you've never really forgiven yourself, accepted the forgiveness that God has offered you. And so you're constantly asking God to forgive you, forgive you, forgive you. And God has already forgiven you. He says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Not just some, but all of it. And I want to say to you, is that's you. And God forgives you. And if God has forgiven you, then accept it and move on. Because you have a relationship to build with God. Hallelujah. Amen? Confession. The other thing that confession does, which is very important for us, and I want you to pay attention to this. The other thing that confession does is that when we are confessing, a lot of times we are reminded of where our short, shortcomings and our faults are. It also gives us awareness so that we do not repeat the same thing. When we reflect and look back at what we, the mistakes and the sins we've committed, we're like, you know what? I mean, this is like the third time in my prayer time. I'm just praying about this thing, eh? I, I, yeah, I think I need to, uh, I, I need to change my behavior now. I need to do something different from what I've been doing. It brings an awareness. That's how transformation happens. Transformation is an intersection of your experience and God's truth. When there's a confrontation between your experience and God's truth, that awareness that is created causes you to be transformed because you're like, yeah, I, I, you know, I hurt someone today. And I'm, you know, I don't want to do that anymore because I'm confessing it. I own it and then I'm going to walk away from it. The, the other thing that it does is also brings to mind the restitution. When we pray and we think about the times we can pray and ask God for forgiveness, but then there's times to not just ask for forgiveness, but actually ask people for forgiveness. Like, you know, I, it, could, it could be your wife or your spouse, and you need to go and apologize to them. It's not just enough for you to pray, but go and apologize. Say, you know, really, I am sorry. I really am sorry. And maybe for some is to actually make actual restitution, like pay someone money that you owe. Aki, that's a word for someone. Just pray. Pay money. Fix something. You broke at the office. You're the one who broke that thing at the office. Nobody knew. You knew. Maybe you just need to go and come clean and say, you know, guys, it's me who broke the printer. And I'm, I'll pay. That's the power of prayer. Is you're transformed. So it's not, it's you're building, there's something that's happening. There's an intersection that happens. And when we confess, it's powerful because it begins to re-energize us. Because we're no longer having to hide. You understand that? You're no longer having to hide, but you're clean and open and honest. And God is able to work inside of you and to give you the spiritual power that you need to become all that you need to become. Confession. Confession is a powerful thing. As we do it, you become more empowered and you grow in your intimacy with God. Thirdly is thanksgiving. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul admonishes in chapter 5 verse 18, he admonishes us to give thanks in all circumstances. To give thanks. Say that with me. Give thanks in all circumstances. Come on, say it once more time. If you ask me, I think we do okay when it comes to giving thanks. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. It's, it's, in fact, it's part of Christian lingo to say thank you, God, and thank you, Jesus. In terms of feeling gratitude, many of us, if you ask us, are you thankful to God? They will tell you, yes, I'm very, I feel very thankful. I'm very blessed by God. I'm very, very grateful to God. But many of us struggle with expressing it, expressing thankfulness to God. Thankfulness to God that is not expressed does not exist. It's like looking at someone in your family or someone that you love and care about and thinking, you know, I'm just thinking this inside of me. I really love you. But I'm just thinking it. To them, it doesn't exist until you say it. You all know the story of the guy who was married for many years and had his wife come to him and tell him, but you, ne you, know, you never tell me you love me. And he said, uh, well, I did when I married you. When I change my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> and sometimes we think, you know, we're taking our relationship with God that way. We do not express thankfulness. We must be thankful. 
We must be thankful in your prayer time. Thankful. Thank God. There's something powerful. Jesus tells us a story of the ten lepers. Here's, here's what happens. Let me tell you the power of thankfulness. It's a spiritual principle that you must adopt in your life. And in, 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 when Jesus tells the story of the ten lepers, he says that there was ten guys that were here. They had leprosy. Now, lepros, leprosy was a, a disease that affected you physically. It was on your skin. It was a skin condition. So your skin would be infected and, and it would go basically progressively worse. Enters into your flesh, begins to eat your flesh, and eventually you die. If you were a, a leper during Jesus' time, you were not even allowed to be in the city. You had to be to live in a leper's colony. And if you were going to come into the city, then you had to come in with some bell or some whistle or something just to notify people. Hey, hey, leper coming through, coming through, leper coming through. So they get out of the way so you do not affect them. And so leprosy had two consequences in the life of a leper. First of all, it was a physical condition in itself. You were sick physically and you needed physical healing. But secondly, it had a social element to it. What that meant is you experienced, they ex lepers experienced a great deal of rejection. You couldn't be with your family. You could not hang around with people. And you had to be identified as a sick person who's an outcast in the community. And so there was an emotional shame and rejection attached to it. In the story that Jesus tells us, he says that of the 10 lepers that went were healed, they were physically healed. Do you understand? Jesus healed them physically. When they looked at themselves, the leprosy was gone. The one guy that came back who Jesus talks about, he goes, he sees he's healed, he comes back and he throws himself at the master's feet and he says, thank you. Thank you for healing me. Thank you. Thank you, master, for taking away my leprosy. And he stands up. What does Jesus say to him? Go your way. You are whole. You are now whole. That word translated means completely whole. He was completely healed. Now here's the difference. He was not only healed physically, he was healed internally as well. Jesus was saying the shame of your disease, the effect of that disease that had on you has been removed. The other guys, the other guys who left had a physical healing, but they had no internal healing because they had no gratitude or gratefulness or thankfulness in their heart. Listen to me and listen to me well. When you begin to get thankful to God, there's healing that only comes as a result of gratitude and nothing else but gratitude to God. And don't you forget it. You be thankful to God. You be thankful to God. You be thankful because some of the prayers you're praying, you're praying because of the blessings that God gave you in the beginning. You remember when you had no business? You remember when you had no job and all you cried to God for was, oh God, give me this job. Oh God, I pray something. And then he gave it to you. And, then you, and for a moment you were grateful. And then our hearts, our hearts, my heart included, are so we get so deceived by life. And then it becomes like, oh, you know what? Uh, this job is hard now. Uh, I need more money. Uh, I need to fuel my car. Now, before you didn't mind walking or taking a mat, but now you have a car now. This car is, is giving me problems. Father, I believe I claim a new car. Father, make a way, whatever, you know. <laughs> and you forget. Some of you are sitting here on a wealth of God's blessing and you've never come into a service and said, today I'm coming to church to just give thanks to God because he has been good. In spite of all the problems I have in my life, God has been good. And some of you need to remember that. You need to remember that because in your thankfulness, healing will come. In your thankfulness, wholeness will come. Mental, emotional, relational, gratefulness to God is recognizing that you know what? I cannot take the next breath if he doesn't give me to me. You can't even think your next thought if he doesn't allow it. And David reminded himself all the time. He used to go to God. You read it in the psalm. He says, what, what am I? He says, what am I? I was a shepherd boy. I was just a shepherd boy taking care of sheep, forgotten. Even when the king was being anointed, nobody remembered who I was. But he said, but God, you remembered me. You changed the course of destiny. And you set me up. And you saved me from the Philistine. And you saved me from a king that wanted to kill me. And you put me on the throne. I will not forget. And the reason we have to remember is because your heart will forget. My heart will forget. And when I go to God, I am thankful. I am grateful. I may not have everything I want. Oh, but I'm thankful. I know I don't deserve to be here. I don't deserve the things that I have. The peace, the joy, the love that I get. The family, I don't deserve any of that. I have all those things because of God's goodness, kindness, and mercy. And I must never take it for granted. 
And so finally he says, after we give thanks to him, and we experience wholeness, now we can pray. He says, now we can have supplication. To supplicate is to bring your needs to God. Remember in the beginning, when you come and adored him, you put God in his rightful, rightful place. You recognize he is not man. He is God. I worship because you are God. I worship you because you're the creator of the universe. You made me. You designed me. You're the one who's in charge. You are God. You deserve honor and glory. You are God. And then when we confess, we look at ourselves. We're like, I am broken. I am messed up. I have fault. I have sinned. I, 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 I need help. I need forgiveness and mercy. If we put ourselves in our right place. We confess who we really are. And then thirdly, when we come in thanksgiving, we recognize what we have, the things and the blessings that God has given us, and we tell our soul to be grateful to God. Then he says, when, you're, when you've done that, now you can pray. Now you can pray. Now you can begin to call on my name. Now let me say something here. We can pray for anything we want. There's nothing that you cannot pray for. But when we do these first three things first, it puts our mind in the right frame. It puts our heart in the right frame. And then we can begin to pray. Jesus says, there is things that can only happen by prayer. I'm going to say this. Because some of you are listening to me and you are in circumstances. Oh, and by the way, let me just tell you, you are either in one of three places in this life and in your journey of faith. You could be, number one, coming out of a crisis. Number two, you could be in a crisis. Or number three, you could be headed to a crisis. You'll always be in one of these three places. And your life right now might not look like you're headed for a crisis, but I promise you, you hung around long enough and it's coming. And there are things that will not change. Please hear me. They will not change until you pray. God will make sure of that. That things will happen, we'll try this, we'll try that. Have you ever had just things that you're trying to work? The solution is like, this thing is so easy. I Me, mean, I don't know why it's not happening. And you're like, guys, what's, what's happening? Things are not moving. Things are not happening. And the angels and the Lord up are saying, Allah? So you forgot. You forgot who your source is. You forgot where your power comes from. You forgot that you cannot take your next step without prayer. And finally, when all seems lost and you fall on your knees and collapse and say, God, uh, help. He says, ah, your posture is right. And help is released. We must pray. We must pray when we do not feel like it. You will not always feel like prayer, but you must pray. You must quiet your soul and say, talk to God. You must pray. David says that. You read through the Psalms. When you read the Psalms, you see this. You see him grappling with some Psalms are like three verses. Others are like 150 verses. It's like he's all over the place, but he knew, he understood. There are times he could not, but he would talk to his soul. Say, I will put my hope in God. I will call out to the Lord. I will cry out. I will come to him, the rock that's higher than I. I will call on the name who's worthy to be praised. And I'll be rescued from my enemies. My faith and my confidence is not in the flesh. It's not in these things that we see. It's in God himself. Because I know he's more than able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all I could ever ask or imagine. And so in that moment, I begin to pray. I pray for my family. I pray for my kids. I pray for the ministry. I pray for my work. I pray for health. I pray for all these things. I pray for the things I'm worried about. I commit them to God because I know that he's more than able. And we must believe. We must be completely persuaded that when we we pray God will answer and God will answer. He will answer. I'm going to invite us to stand up right now. Something's going to happen in this service as we pray right now. The presence of God is here. We're going to ask God to come through. Some of you, some of us are in extremely difficult situations. Very difficult. Some of you have no answers. And there's no one that can give you an answer. God says, you call on my name and I will show you great and powerful things. I will come and I will move on your behalf. And you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be ashamed. You're not by yourself. 
Some of you may be here feeling like you're fighting a battle by yourself, all alone. No one cares. Nobody even knows where you are. Listen, there's a God in heaven who knows exactly where you are. He knows your address and he's about to move and to do something powerful in your life if you will call on his name, if you will pray. So Father, we raise our hands to you right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we lift you up. We adore you. You are worthy of praise. Father, we adore your name. Just begin to open your mouth and right now as an act of surrender, supplication, begin to adore him, begin to confess, begin to th give thanks right now for a few minutes. Let's just do this. Father, in the name of Jesus, Spirit of God, come upon us, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we give you thanks. We bless your name. We praise you. You're worthy, O oh God. You are great and powerful. Worthy is your name. There is no God like you. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, your name is to be praised. We praise you, O oh God. We bless you, you who does wonders, you who does miracles, the mighty God, the glorious God, the faithful one, the promise-keeping God. We worship you. Come on downtown, just open your mouth and begin to bless him right now. Just say something to God. Speak right now in the name of Jesus. We confess our brokenness. We confess our sins. We confess our failures and our weakness. We confess that we have leaned on our own understanding and not on you. We confess that, Father, we have cheapened the grace that you've given to us. We confess that we have been unjust and unfair. We confess our selfishness and our weakness, God. We confess to you, you who forgives sin. You who died on the cross for us, forgive us, Lord. Forgive us. Wipe away our transgression. Do not remember our faults anymore. Lord, I pray that we'll be cleansed by the blood. We'll be washed clean today in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, God. We praise you, Lord. We offer thanksgiving for your forgiveness, for the grace that you've given to us, for your mercy that is great, for your help that you sent to us. Lord, when we had no hope, you are our hope. Lord, when we had no strength, you are our strength. Lord, when we had no one to speak for us, you spoke for us. You made a way where there was no way. You created streams in the desert. Father, you caused there to rain in our lives. You took away our shame and our guilt. How can we not be thankful? How can we not be grateful to you, O oh God? You remembered us in our times of weakness. You delivered us from our enemies. You set our feet on a rock, Lord. We believe bless you today and we thank you. We are grateful people for your blessings. We are grateful for your goodness. We are grateful for your mercy and for your help. We are thankful, Lord Jesus. In all things, Father, we praise you. We bless you and we praise you, God, in the name of Jesus. And God, we present our needs to you. You know us well. You know us well. Lord, when we rise up and when we lay our heads down to sleep, you have searched our hearts. You know what's inside of our hearts. God, our worries, our concerns for our families. Lord, for our situations at work. I pray in Jesus' name that you will come through for people. Lord, we supplicate. We cry out. We present our needs to you. We cry out to you. Father, our hope, our trust, our confidence is in you. Oh, great God. We will not look to any other. We will look to you, God. When our confidence is shaken, we will look to you, Father. Provide a way. Make a way. Heal us, Lord. Heal us from sickness. Heal our families, oh God. Move in our businesses. Uh, Lord, intercede, Lord, where there are court cases. Uh, Father, fight our battles, we pray. We need your help, oh God. Come and fight, oh God. Rejuvenate our spiritual your energy. Ignite us with your power once again in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Father. We bless you because we know you will do it. Father, we, you will not put us to shame. Our confidence in you is not in vain. We will proclaim for us, for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. We know you will come through. We know you will answer. We know you will fight for us. We know you are the great God. Hallelujah. We praise your name in Jesus' name. And God's people gave him a great praise and a great glory. Come on, church. Let's bless him. Come on, you can do better than that. Let's worship him. Come on, raise a prayer to God. He's the great king. He's the mighty God. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. There's power in prayer. I said there's power in prayer. You can do whatever you want, but you cannot go against a praying woman. You cannot go against a praying man. You cannot go against our praying family. There is power in prayer. I'm speaking encouragement and life into your soul right now. When, all, when everything fails, 
If you will pray, there will be an answer that will come. Hallelujah. God is more. Yes. Amen. Yes. 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 All right. So this is what we're going to do. Some of us are struggling. Maybe you're forming. And some of you might have a great prayer life. Hey, listen, if that's you, you know, great. We celebrate with you. Some of you are beginning to form and to sort of kind of get into this prayer thing. Use this model. Try it this week. I want you to try it this week. Let's repeat it together. What are the four things that you're going to do? Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. One more time. Thanks. Come on again. Adoration, thanksgiving. This week, I want you in your prayer time. When you carve time away, it doesn't have to be long. It doesn't, it doesn't have to have a lot of things. Maybe 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. Just spend time and do this and watch your spiritual batteries come back to life. Amen? All right. Amen. All right. So, so next Sunday, we're going to have a, the services, the 9 o'clock and the 11 services are going to be prayer services. So bring your prayer items. We're going to actually spend time here praying with you, believing God with you, and trusting God to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ever think or imagine. Amen? Now, I'm going to bless you as you go and, and, and that the Lord will keep you and be with you. Would you just stretch your hands out? Let me bless us. Father, you are good. We are not by ourselves. And Lord, we pray, I bless you, God's people. I bless you with strength. I bless you with grace. Let the memory of your prayers come before God. May you be blessed this week, Mavuno Downtown. May your Father remember you as you adore Him, as you confess, as you give thanks, and as you present your needs to Him. I pray that you be energized, you be provided for. May you walk, may you go with a sense this week that there is a greater one among you because you pray. And when you call on His name, may He bless you. So I bless you with peace, I bless you with joy, I bless you with the presence of of God and his face shine upon you and give you peace in Jesus name we pray amen amen I love you God bless you we'll see you next Sunday